So let's now look at an example where we're going to do just that. We're going to calculate if something or if a process is spontaneous by examining all the components that have to do with this process. And so in this question, what we have is two gases, and they both start at the same pressure and temperature, and that they're in a box that's separated by an impermeable membrane. And what we're going to show is that they will mix spontaneously when we remove that partition. And so what this looks like is I have a box. This is my initial case. And there's this impermeable membrane. And inside one half of the box, I have one gas. And in the other side of the box, I have a second gas. And that both of these gases, they are going to be at a total pressure of P. And I'm just going to finish labeling these boxes where I have this is box A and this is box B. And that this has a total number of moles Na and this has a total number of moles inside this box Nb. The final case, or the case that we want to show is spontaneous, is now we have this box. Inside this box, we have the gas molecules now, and they've mixed. And so we, this is the final case that we're trying to, to figure out. And that what we want to show is that the change in Gibbs free energy is less than zero, meaning that it's spontaneous for when we take away this partition, we're going to get complete mixing in the box. And of course, the pressures inside this box now, we will have a partial pressure of A, and we will have a partial pressure of B, but that PA plus PB is going to be equal to that total pressure that we had here a second ago. So this P is the same as these P's. And then just finishing labeling off, I'm going to have inside this box A and B, so they're mixed together, and that the total number of moles, which if we just add this together, we're just going to get total number of moles N. So then let's determine the Gibbs free energy in the initial and the final case. And then we'll subtract the two, and we'll find out if the change is less than zero. So the initial Gibbs free energy is equal to the number of moles of A times the chemical potential of A plus the number of moles of B times the chemical potential of B. And again, this is just from the definition of Gibbs free energy, taking into account or writing it as an expression of chemical potentials. And if I substitute in, what we get is number of moles of species A times the standard chemical potential of species A plus RT times the natural logarithm of the pressure P over P standard. And here I've just substituted in P directly because I know the pressure inside the box is P. To that I'm going to add the number of moles of species B times the chemical potential of species B plus RT times the natural logarithm of P over P standard. And again, I'm just substituting it directly because the pressure in that box is just, again, it's P. What about for the final case? So the final Gibbs free energy, I start writing it the same way, the number of moles of A times the chemical potential of A times the number of moles of B times the chemical potential of B. But in this case, I'm going to slightly change what the next step is going to be. I have number of moles of A times the chemical or the standard chemical potential of A plus RT times the natural logarithm of the partial pressure of A over the standard partial pressure. And to that I'm going to add the number of moles of B, and that's going to be multiplied by the standard chemical potential of species B plus RT times the natural logarithm of the partial pressure of B over the standard pressure. Now the one thing that we can write, or what we can do now, is that these partial pressures of A and partial pressures of B, we can apply Dalton's law, where we can say that that partial pressure, well that's just equal to the mole fraction of A times the total pressure inside the box. And the same thing happens here with the partial pressure of B, that's just equal to the mole fraction of B times the total pressure P. So if I write out those terms with the mole fractions and the total pressures written in instead, I get number of moles of species A times the standard chemical potential of species A plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of A times the total pressure divided by the standard pressure. And to that I'm going to add number of moles of species B times the standard chemical potential of species B plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of B 
times the total pressure divided by the standard potential, or sorry, the standard pressure. The final thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to invoke natural logarithm rules so that I can split up some of these natural logarithms. And again, if you have natural logarithms that are um, the multiplication of two terms, so say for instance this one right here, then I can write this as the natural logarithm of, say, the mole fraction of A plus the natural logarithm of the total pressure over the standard pressure, meaning that if things are multiplied together, I can write them as the sum of logarithms, and if they're divided, then I can write them as the difference of natural logarithms. In this case, I want to separate the mole fraction from the pressure terms, and so that's why there's a plus sign in between. So by doing that for both of these natural logarithm terms, what I end up with is the number of moles of A times the standard chemical potential of A plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of A plus RT times the natural logarithm of the total pressure over the standard pressure. And to that I'm going to add the total number of moles of B times the standard chemical potential of B plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of B plus RT times the natural logarithm of the total pressure divided by the standard pressure. All right, so now we're ready to determine if this process or if this mixing is spontaneous. And remember, again, what we were trying to find out is, is the change in Gibbs free energy, which is just going to be equal to the final minus the initial, if this is less than zero? And so now what we have is an expression for the final and the initial Gibbs free energy. And so now we just have to take these two terms and subtract them from each other and then deduce if we're going to have something that's less than zero. So writing this out explicitly, we're going to have the change in Gibbs free energy. Well, the final is just going to be Na for the number of moles of species A times the standard chemical potential of species A plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of species A plus RT times the natural logarithm of the total pressure divided by the standard pressure. We have plus the number of moles of species B, and that's going to be multiplied by the standard chemical potential of species B, plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of species B, plus RT times the natural logarithm of the total pressure divided by the standard pressure. And from that, I'm going to be subtracting off the number of moles of A times the standard chemical potential of species A plus RT times the natural logarithm of P over P standard. And from that I'm going to be adding on within this bracket the number of moles of species B times the mole fraction of species B or the standard chemical potential of species B plus RT times the natural logarithm of the total pressure over the standard pressure. My next step here is I'm just going to start crossing out like terms. For instance, I have a total moles of A times the standard chemical potential of A. Here I have that exact same term. And so I can cancel out that mole fracture, sorry, that chemical potential, the standard of species A. I have the same thing for the standard chemical potential of species B. I also have this term where I have an RT ln total pressure over the standard pressure, and I have it multiplied by the number of moles of A, and I have it by the number of moles of B. And here again, I have the number of moles of A multiplied with RT times the natural logarithm of the total pressure over the standard pressure, and I have the same thing here. So these two terms also disappear. So the only thing that I have left over is these terms that have to do with the mole fraction of A and the mole fraction of B. And so that's what I'm going to write in my next line. So the change in Gibbs free energy is the number of moles of A times RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of A plus the total moles of B times RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of species B. In order to continue simplifying this, then I just want you to remember that the mole fraction of some species is just equal to the number of moles of that species divided by the total number of moles. And so I can rearrange this so that I can have the number of moles of some species, and that's equal to the mole fraction of that species times the total number of moles. And I'm just going to take that and just substitute that into my expression over here, where I have, again, my change in Gibbs free energy. Well, in this case, the number of moles of species A is equal to the mole fraction of species A times the total number of moles, times RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of A. 
And to that, I'm going to add, again, I have the number of moles of species B. I'm just going to express that as the mole fraction of species B times the total number of moles in the system times RT natural logarithm of the mole fraction of species B. And then what I can do is I can distribute out the total number of moles, this R, and this T term. So NRT, that's equal to, or that's going to be times the mole fraction of A times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of A plus the mole fraction of B times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of B. And so we've finally made it to the part where we can actually start to figure out, is this term less than zero, meaning that the mixing of this gas was spontaneous. And so I'm not actually going to give you a number, we're just going to use some, some reasoning to show that yes indeed the Gibbs free energy of this process, the change in Gibbs free energy of this process is indeed less than zero, meaning that it is spontaneous. And so to do that I'm just going to first remind you that the mole fractions are numbers that are going to be between zero and one. And so I'm just writing here, zero is less than the mole fraction of A, which is less than one, and zero is less than or equal to the mole fraction of B, which is less than or equal to one. And so what that means then is that the natural logarithm of a number that's between zero and one, so for instance, the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of A, that's always gonna be less than or equal to zero. And the same thing for the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of B that's also going to be less than or equal to zero. What that means is, is that if you have two terms here, if this number, this ln of the mole fraction of A and this natural logarithm of the mole fraction of B, if both of these numbers are going to be less than zero, then that means this whole term that's in the parentheses, this number is going to be negative because I have a negative number plus a negative number. And so what that means then is that since temperature will always be positive, the gas constant will always be positive, and the number of moles is always going to be positive, then what that means is that my change in Gibbs free energy must be less than zero, or equal to zero, depending upon what the mole fractions are. But what this implies is that if I have any mole fractions that aren't equal to one, meaning I've only got a single component system, then that means then that I will have mixing, meaning that my Gibbs free energy will be less than zero.